Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, um, I'm, I'm Daniel Vetter from Intel's open source team, uh, driver team. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit atomic for kind of driver writers. So not like looking at how you drive the new atomic mode set interface from user space or what the details look in, uh, in the DRM call, but uh, kind of what, what, what the world of atomic looks like from the point of view of a, of a driver. And the biggest part will be just a walkthrough of, of how uh, an atomic mode set, and how that thing doesn't work, uh, works. And the big uh, steps are, uh, first you need to build up in the kernel uh, the new state, uh, the, the new desired state uh, that you want to commit or check. Um, the second step is, uh, you, uh, you compute the, the kind of driver private derived state like PLL clocks and, and things like that and then check whether it, it all fits into your hardware limits whether you haven't run out of memory bandwidth or, or FIFO space or, or planes or whatever kind of uh, hidden uh, resources you have to, to, to drive your display hardware. And that might actually already be the whole thing because uh, upstream atomic is a check only feature where user space can build up the state and lost the kernel so does this work or not uh, before actually uh, committing it which is uh, is useful to figure out which for compositors which uh, planes you need to push into to, uh, the GL render it uh, fallback and then finally I uh, commit the enter state to the, to the hallway which can be done asynchronously oh that's kind of the idea so, uh, state build up, uh, uh, upstream atomic has uh, per object, per kernel mode setting objects, and, uh, and we have, uh, we have uh, connectors, uh, CRTCs, which kind of represent the display plane, connectors are the outputs, uh, and planes, which are kind of the, the scan out engines. That's the three big objects. So for each of them, there's a, a state object which kind of describes the configuration, like which frame buffer you're using, where is the frame buffer placed on the screen, what's the a mode of your screen, or uh, output specific stuff, like is this an HDMI monitor, and all these kind of states and properties. Uh, now, uh, Atomic is, is also, it's, it's doing uh, Incremental updates, that's mostly for backwards compatibility because all the existing old IOCTLs kind of just update partial bits and we still need to support them for all user space. So how that works is you have an atomic duplicate and destroy per object hook, which just grabs the current state and, and duplicates the, uh, from the, the driver and uh, duplicates it into a new object. And because a bunch of these opt, uh, uh, state parameters are themselves reference counted objects like frame buffers or maybe you have big gamma tables that you allocate separately. There's also the destroy hook so you can clean up things correctly. Uh, uh, maybe other bit special thing compared to like ADF is uh, in uh, the atomic will uh, almost everything or all kind of the, the common properties and state things get decoded by the DRM core. So you get a, a real C structure and not just the blob uh, on, the, on the kind of driver interface. Uh, but you can do obviously uh, extensions, driver private extensions on everything. And, and for that, we have the atomic set and get property interfaces. But that's really only uh, if you have like special needs because I'll, I'll talk a bit about extensions and stuff later on. And yeah, for state building, really, if you start with a new driver with a conversion, or we have helper classes for all of these, so just plug them in. And then kind of start subclassing uh, the, the, the structures as, as needed. And since we, we kind of want one overall update, the entire update itself is tracked in a in a DRM atomic state structure, which has then pointers to all the others. For, for, yeah. So, so that's pretty much everything for state building. Really, the, the, the interesting bits there are all in the DRM core, kind of decoding the IOCTL or uh, mapping legacy, uh, legacy IOCTLs to new ones. But 
you don't have to care about that from a driver point of view. So next step is uh, uh, checking the state. And there the driver or the, the driver interface is a lot simpler. There's one a hook, not per object hooks. There's just one hook, atomic check. And that's the entire global entry point. And you get the entire state. And, and obviously, uh, it would be somewhat pointless for every driver to completely implement their own state checking functions. So there's a, a really big modeler helper library. And uh, the modeler part seems to work fairly uh, well, since i915 uh, essentially has its own atomic check function, but reuses a lot of that uh, helper code as needed. So uh, fairly flexible. It does support the old mode fix up callback from from the existing helper libraries, which is, is kind of intentional. Uh, but if you, if you kind of want to, the mode fix up function is fairly restricted because it just gives you the mode and not the entire state object. So for, for all the, uh, if you need to check more, there's per object atomic check functions to kind of let you structure your code a bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, we, we try to keep fairly decent kernel doc for everything. So please just don't blindly copy paste what all drivers have done, but read what the functions do because there's, most of them there's like hints. So if you have special cases, runtime PM or dependency between uh, uh, different functions, uh, it, it usually explains how you can solve them with sometimes even examples. Uh, I have a later on a slide with of links to documentation. So uh, yeah, what are you supposed to do in, in the atomic check functions? And uh, uh, the thing there is usually you have some random limits or some hardware limits that don't fit into the generic KMS model. And there's also often a uh, uh, things you need to uh, compute both in the uh, the check code and in in the commit code. So one example is DP link settings. You need to figure out uh, how many uh, how many lanes you're going to use. What's what's going to be the dot clock, so that you can figure out which clocks you need to enable and whether you have enough of them still. And uh, there, the recommendation is uh, to kind of avoid a fragile code. My recommend. I mean, obviously you can computed in both functions. But my recommendation is to subclass the state structures and just pile in all the pre-computed uh, stuff in there so that in atomic check, you pre-compute all the states, PLL settings, whatever, uh, FIFO uh, sp uh, split ups and, and all these things. And, and they, can, yeah, can I any internal resources? And in atomic check, you just com uh, in, in the commit phase, you just commit it, uh, which um, obviously means you probably end up subclassing almost all of them, but uh, there's, there's tons of examples. We have quite a few drivers nowadays. And uh, for, for that, for looking at examples, my, my recommendation is to uh, uh, look at the most recently merged uh, driver because that one is probably the one most up to date with uh, best practices and not uh, yeah, using helpers as much as possible. Um, but that's kind of just, you have a bit of state that you need to pre-compute to make sure it works. Uh, what are you going to do with uh, cross uh, object uh, limits? For example, uh, uh, if, if you have a bunch of planes on a CRTC and you can scale them, but you only have uh, two scalers, so you need to figure out which of your four or five planes get these two scalers. Or maybe, uh, uh, you have some other constraints. The, the, yeah, you run out of memory bandwidth or FIFO space, so you can't have uh, all, all planes at, at full resolution. And uh, for that, the atomic check functions, even the per object ones that kind of the, li uh, the helper library calls, can uh, look at the state of any other object. And uh, there's a fair bit amount of, of, of magic going on behind uh, uh, the curtains because uh, 
if, if you get a DRM atomic state update, it does not contain states for all the objects because that would mean you, you need to lock and serialize the entire driver state for each update, which means you can't do parallel updates, uh, which is a bit of a problem because maybe you do a mode set or, or a slow uh, uh, output detection cycle on one output and you want to still keep page flipping on the other. So DRM has fairly uh, fine-grained locking uh, and a pretty uh, fancy weight band mutex locking scheme that makes sure that you can't deadlock. But you can ignore all that as long as you always use the provided core and, and helper functions to look at state objects. So if you're in your CHTC state object, you can just uh, first make a call that says, please add all the planes which are on this CRTC. Then the core goes, is going to walk through the planes and make sure it doesn't grab too many locks to unnecessarily serialize and, and add all the plane states for this uh, CRTC. And then you have a, uh, a four micro loop that you can loop through all these plane state objects. And all the locking magic and, and uh, deadlock avoidance. I mean, the, the important thing is for if, if the weight land mutexes detect the deadlock, you need to restart the entire atomic transaction. And you, you realize that, or uh, the, the mutex code tells you that by uh, giving you the e-deadlock error code. So uh, the important bit is to just always handle this error and, and pass it back and clean up. And then essentially the core functions will take care of, of all the state keeping internally, of all the deadlock avoidance. Uh, the, it's obviously, uh, it means that your error handling code needs to actually work. Because if you run into a deadlock in the real world, your machine is going to die otherwise. And so, but it's kind of it's hard to test actual deadlocks uh, with, with compositors because generally you don't have concurrent users. Uh, but we have the config, the, the white band mutex slow path debugging a knob in, in the kernel, which just randomly or pseudo randomly injects deadlock conditions with kind of exponential back off so that you are guaranteed to make forward progress eventually. But anyway, just enable that and you uh, are assured that if you do any kind of these look at other state objects things, uh, your code will be correct and fully tested. Um, the other thing is also uh, f maybe you have uh, super special needs or it's just kind of getting complicated to f going from, from ob per object hooks to kind of look at global interactions. Uh, and in that case, it might be simpler to just write your own at your global atomic check functions. Uh, one example is uh, there, uh, if you do plane updates, you might need to reallocate, reallocate FIFO space. Uh, and MSM driver is, is such an example. And reallocating FIFO space on MSN means you need to shut down all the CRTCs, reallocate FIFO space, and then enable them again. So there you have a dependency between plane updates on mode set state. But mode set state, on the other hand, means if you change the resolution or something like that, uh, you need to recompute all the plane state to kind of uh, re-scissor all, all the rectangles. And so uh, the, the default helpless kind of don't assume that, that you have these kind of dependencies, just je checks mode set state first and, and then plane state. But uh, the MSM driver just overrides the, atomic, the global atomic check hook and, and kind of has a, a, a three-phase. But it first checks plane states for FIFO reallocation, then uh, mode setting, and then for one final step to go over the plane states again uh, to make sure everything is, is up to date. So, so that's kind of one example. The, the basic help is don't, or the default implementation doesn't cut it. But since modular and you can just pick and choose, or you can build up your own fancy thing if needed. And again, just enable weight round mutex slow path debugging and you should be fully covered. Um, This is kind of good enough for cross-stage checking as long as you still have an object where you can track uh, your state. So uh, yeah, maybe the per CRTC FIFO space that you need to split between planes and things like that.
But uh, of course, there's also really global resources uh, like PLL, so maybe your FIFO space is, is actually global. And uh, maybe it's, it's not, it, it gets a bit complicated if you, if you, if you kind of try to uh, track that in CRTCs or so. So uh, there's an optional support to uh, subclass the DRM atomic state structure so that you can extend it with your own things. And, and similar with everything else, uh, uh, have, have a bit of storage where you can pre-compute state, like which CRTC gets which uh, display PLL, things like that, <coughs> or how you, you split up things. Uh, of course, if you have something global, you need a lock for that. And it absolutely must be a weight band mutex lock, otherwise locked up will scream at you. And there's going to be deadlock. And uh, you can do your own. The atomic core doesn't care. You can freely add more locks. Uh, but really, if at least in the cases this far, all these global resources kind of reassigning required mode sets anyway. And uh, any mode set currently takes the mode config connection mutex. This is, is kind of the thing that protects the CRTC to uh, connect the routing. So you, you can just reuse that and be done with it. And this uh, optional atomic state alloc and clear and free uh, hooks that you can use to do this subclassing. Uh, maybe the, the clear one is, is meant to uh, just reset uh, your state, and it's used in, in the backup logic. So that, that's kind of the point where uh, the weight band mutex uh, deadlock avoidance does leak slightly into the driver. If there's a deadlock and the core needs to restart the transaction, uh, it, it's going to call you clear so you can throw out any kind of intermediate state. And yeah, currently that's just used by the Intel driver, and we use it to. Uh, I think right now we use it for two bits. One is for shared PLLs, tracking them and assigning them. And the other is for the display clock, uh, core clock. We can clock down the, the display block to save a bit of power, but obviously we need to off-clock it again when, when user asks for a higher resolution or a few other cases. So that's kind of the, the hooks and, and facilities for, for global state. Uh, then there is, uh, so that, that's, that's essentially the bits for uh, checking the state. And uh, then comes the actually committing things to hardware. Uh, again, there's just one entry uh, point, atomic commit, which is supposed to do everything. And yeah, the, the entire point of atomic is that uh, it's, it's uh, a check commit transaction. It can't fail because user, user space asked for something impossible. Really, the only, only thing your atomic commit is allowed to, to fail is when you run out of memory or when your hardware died, which does happen. But, but yeah, so uh, really everything that, all the constraints really have to be checked in, in atomic check. And the core also guarantees that atomic check is called first. <coughs> So that's why all the pre-computing works. So you, you always know that your atomic check code has been called, and all the derived state has been updated. So you can rely on that uh, in your atomic uh, commit function. Um, of course, there's, since it's just one entry point and there's lots of objects, and it just doesn't make sense to reinvent wheels for everyone, there's, again, a, a big helper library it's, again, fairly modular. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, but I'd say even more important here is the default atomic check function that the helper libraries provide. They're really optimized for backwards compatibility uh, with the legacy mode set uh, infrastructure. So uh, if, if it doesn't fit for your driver, it's not because the helpers are kind of useless. It's just they're optimized for a really restricted case. But there's lots, uh, since you can call the individual bits and there's, there's uh, all the helper functions that you can use instead of the, the ones the default implementation calls, uh, it does fit, I think, or at least as far it does seem to fit for all the drivers we have this far. 
So uh, yeah, bit bit more about the actual commit phase and how the helpers are kind of the basic assumptions of the the helper code. Uh, one is uh, that plane updates and and modes uh, so plane updates like where's your cursor and and what's the size or upscaling of your video overlay and all these things is is completely orthogonal to mode set changes. And mode set changes is like changing your resolution or the output routing and these kind of things. And of course, in, in real world hardware, uh, that's totally not the case. But you can drive the helpers. The helpers internally also kind of pre-compute uh, what kind of planes you need to update and where you need to do a mode set. So by kind of updating these pre-computed uh, steering booleans to control the, uh, the code flow, you, you can I told the, the helpers, oh yeah, th for you this kind of doesn't look like there's a mode set needed, but I know I need to move around a few things, like the MSM example, the, uh, it needs to do a mode set for, uh, oh yeah, shut down everything and then elbow it again for uh, uh, reassigning FIFO space. So you just can set these bits in the atomic check function, kind of the pre-computed state. And then when you, you call the helpers in the atomic a commit step, the helpers see, oh yeah, there's a, no, a mode set needed, and we'll go through the entire mode set flow. So it's a bit of a strong requirement at, at face value, but uh, since you can fully control what the helpers consider a, a mode set change and the uh, plane changes, it, it is actually fairly uh, flexible. Uh, the other bit, which is uh, quite a bit different from the existing helpers, is there's not going to be any partial enable, disable updates, which kind of the helpers did. So if you kind of just shot down one output in a cloning configuration, it just killed the connector and let everything run. So what the helpers do is, uh, when anything changes in the mode set configuration, it shuts down everything with the old configuration, and then re-enables everything again with the new one. And uh, that does tend to reduce complexity quite a bit, because old code had a lot of, is this really still enabled or not kind of checks uh, splattered all over. And it kind of also reduces testing complexity, because all these kind of partial disable enables, you don't have to bother with them. And I mean, looking at driver code, probably no one ever bothered with testing that anyway. Uh, the other thing that's gone is, is DPMS. That's, that's the, the, the runtime power saving stuff. And it's, it's entirely implemented in helpers by just reusing the mode set pass. So if you say, uh, go to DBS, DPMS off, it, from the driver point of view, it looks exactly like just killing the output entirely. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. We killed all the submodes because hardware stopped supporting them like over five years ago. So the help is just remap it to on off. So all the standby suspend is just clamped to off. When you say that it looks like turning the output off, that means deleting the frame buffer? Uh, that's the thing. From, from your atomic commit back end, it looks like turning everything off. But from your check commit, it looks like everything is still on. So from a resource assignment point of view, everything is still uh, there. So the frame buffer is still pinned and all this stuff. But from kind of the back, th that's kind of a nice thing with the, the new helpers and something that I try to do is that, because DPMS is kind of used by X as in, I can always DPMS on again and it will work. So you need to make sure that all the resources are still reserved. So the atomic check needs to treat uh, DPMS on, uh, off as like DPMS off, on. So completely oblivious to that. But the check uh, shouldn't need to care. Uh, the commit, sorry, I'm making a bit of a mess. But the commit doesn't need to care. And that's what the helpers do. So to know that you're DPMS off, like is that something you're supposed to Uh, the, yeah, there's a bit of confusion because some drivers for DPMS suspend kept like VBlanks running and stuff like that. And the new rules are if you do DPMS off, 
uh, there's not going to be V-blanks and things anymore. That's pretty terrible. Because seriously, if you're running an animation and you expect it to be playing, and it's going to suddenly run at what frame, at what frame rate just because somebody walked away from the screen, you still want the thing when you come back and hit the button that it, that it shows the state of the animation where it currently is. Well, I mean, if you go DPMS off, I think you shouldn't render. So you need to fake things anyway. You need to kind of. You can't assert that the, the, the application doing the rendering is not the application in charge of presentation, right? Your 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 CAD application or your your physics simulation is running at a, at a frame rate. It's it's using that as a clock. It probably shouldn't, but this happens. So you can't have. There's no way for it to even know that anything that's happening. Right? Uh, so ideally, it should. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is essentially, in the past, most drivers did stop V-blank already. At least in. V-blank emulation and the radiant driver for when the displays are. And, and yeah, the thing is. In the, in the DDX. Yeah, in the DDX. So, so but the, the thing is, the, the, the point here in the kernel is by making the rules known and uniform across drivers, you, the user space expectations are the same. And it's if you do anything but DPMS on, you're not going to have events. and. So, if there is a user pending, space. If there's a pending V blank when you DPMS off, what do you tell user space? Uh, that's one of the later on slides. Essentially, uh, page flips are done asynchronously. Right, so if you've got a pending page flip and you DPMS off. Uh, the, I mean, DPMS off is just another atomic commit, and they should be ordered. So the DPMS off happens after the page flip. M must. Page, page flip is asynchronous, though. Well, you can do the DPMS off asynchronously, too. But if you do it synchronously, you need to stall for any of the preceding updates to make sure things don't blow up. Okay. And that's because that's actually a fairly tricky problem in full generality. We don't have helpers for that anymore. And that's one of the to-do slides later on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is also lots of old, old hooks are deprecated. Uh, I mean, the old, old helpers had like DPMS hooks and differences between uh, kind of disable and actually shut off, shut up, shut off the, the CRTC and the release resources. Because in the old helpers, you drive the code, have to make sure that DPMS and, and real shutting things off was treated uh, correctly. Uh, and most others are optional, which is something we kind of done piece by piece as drivers got merged where people said, like, I don't have a need for this hook here. Uh, so we killed those. And the legacy state still gets updated. So if you have an old driver, you can kind of still rely on that somewhat, but you can also just ignore it. Uh, so overall, it's, uh, it's a lot less boilerplate, which is uh, nice. Uh, the, the atomic commit flow is uh, first is prepare FB. Th that's in the helpers, uh, which is meant to get yeah, pin frame buffers and stuff. This is called synchronously in all cases, so you can still tell user space, sorry, I've run out of memory. Uh, then the new state object gets wrapped into kind of the permanent uh, state pointers. So that's kind of the software side commit that's done there. And then there's the split off. Uh, everything past that point can be done asynchronously, which is like waiting for fences and buffers that the actual uh, help, uh, commit to hardware built from, from helpers or driver code or whatever that's going to be in the next slide. Then uh, the, the default implementation waits for a V-blank to pass and then calls clean out frame buffer for you so uh, you can unpin and release all the frame buffers you done. Or the, at least for simple drivers, you don't have to keep track of that. And of course, if any of the prepare FB call, uh, call fails, it's also going to call clean up FB uh, for you. So partial failures mid midway, you, you don't have to bother with them either if you're using helpers. Now the, oops, that was one too much. 
The actual commit, uh, like I said, uh, mode sets and, and plane updates are orthogonal. So with the, the mode set updates, it's uh, the CRTC objects encoders, which you just kind of the glue thing internally used between CRTCs and connectors, mostly by helpers. There are exposed to user space, but you can ignore that. It was a failed attempt at trying to expose routing limitations and just doesn't work. And there's also in the helpers so-called bridges where you, which you can use to chain up encoder chains and, and with the idea to uh, reuse bridge drivers across SOCs. But bridges very exactly like in, in the legacy helpers, so that code just goes over. Uh, yeah, pretty much everything from mode set, uh, I said already, it has a deterministic enable deep disable flow and should be quite a bit simpler than the old code. For plane updates, there's kind of three phases. One is on, the C on each CRTC, uh, atomic begin gets called, which you can use to uh, avoid, e evade the V-blank so that your update doesn't get split over two frames. Or oh, if you have nice hardware, uh, start uh, uh, the, the, the update blocking step, if you have hardware support for this. And then there's a per plane atomic update or disable hook. The, the atomic disable is, is optional. If you don't have that, it just calls atomic update for even when planes get disabled. And at the end, there's a per CRTC atomic flush that you can, in all the hardware solutions, they just have a go bit, but you just load up the state and then knock on that bit and it gets committed to hardware atomically. Or you have the, the to release updates so that they get committed to uh, the, the display block again. So it all happens in one step. And that kind of three-phase uh, approach seems to work this far for all the drivers, even Intel, which has no hardware support at all. So seems to help a bit there. And the, the plane update stuff is, is new because legacy uh, uh, mode set code kind of didn't have any notion of atomic plane updates, so it was just one hook, update this plane, update that plane. So this split up into three phases is new in the atomic helpers. And, and that's kind of the end of, of the overview of, of how an atomic update happens in the three phases. We're first preparing the state, then checking it, pre-computing your internal derived uh, driver state, and then committing everything to Harvey. Uh, now, if Atomic always does incremental updates uh, of the existing state, you have a bit of problem with bootstrapping, uh, driver load, or resume the, the real world kind of fell out of sync with your driver. And uh, yeah, Atomic assumes that this never happens. So there's the recommended way is to have the per object, to re use the per object reset hooks. Uh, and you, there's kind of two approaches. One is you just smash hardware to all off and, and reset software state to all off. That's, that's kind of the reset. But you don't have to do a reset. Uh, the second option, which is what Dynan15 does, all way with its own infrastructure, is uh, actually read out the current hardware state and, and map it to the software objects so that you can uh, uh, perfectly take over the configuration from your bootloader and avoid uh, uh, unnecessary mode set on, on boot up. So that's, that's kind of how bootstrapping, uh, bootstrapping works. Uh, the other thing you might uh, want to slightly care about, but really for most drivers it's going to be just plug in the helpers is legacy entry points. Uh, the DRM core obviously has a implementations for all of them using the new Atomic interface. So you really only need to implement Atomic. But if you have like an existing driver with some old feature that you kind of don't want to re-implement in Atomic or it's just too much pain or there's no need, uh, all these hooks are, are exported to drivers. So you can just do that if this is this special case I kind of still need to support in our break old user space call my legacy code, otherwise just do the atomic commit. So uh, again, quite flexible to build up things. It also helps if you're kind of converting a driver because then 
you can first convert just the plane updates and fill out the plane hooks. And then when you, when you kind of have the full mode set updates working, uh, you can fill up the legacy entry points for mode sets. And kind of in the next step, uh, when you uh, even have the async part working, then you can also fill out the legacy uh, page flip hooks. So that, that kind of makes uh, transitions a bit more gradual, uh, which is pretty useful, at least from kind of the Intel perspective, because we've been working on the conversions since, I think, three releases by now. Um, yeah, what's kind of ongoing for uh, currently in 4.4 is a new set of helpers from Jerry Redding uh, for uh, a suspend resume, which just u uses on the suspend side the atomic hooks to kind of duplicate all the current state, and then on the resume side, commit that again after, of course, you've reset uh, the, the software state to match the everything is off state again. So you can implement suspend resume with two function calls, which is fairly nice. Uh, the other thing is FBDEF has been converted to use atomic if it's there. So kind of just more uses. Uh, the next thing is uh, there's uh, an active only plane update in the helpers, which uh, should help a lot if you support runtime PM, because the legacy helpers updated the planes in between the mode set sequence. So when everything was shot up, I shut off, but before all the new state was enabled, planes were updated. Which means if you do runtime PM, planes get updated when the hardware is off, which is somewhere between uh, pointless and it's going to crash your SOC. So there's an active only flag, and of course, since the helpers are modularly, you can push the plane updates to the end where everything is on again and actually enabled, and you can actually update the planes. And yeah, that's kind of better support for runtime PM in general. Um, future work is, is general async commit. Like I just said, the, the discussion with Keith, uh, async is kind of hard in full generality, and we haven't solved that yet. Right now, it's like every driver does their own thing with just a, a work queue, which is not really great. But the problem really is, I mean, uh, Google's ADF has generic async, but they just have one queue, which would render all the fine-grained locking and parallelism completely pointless. And if you try to uh, support all the crazy dependencies that hardware might have between this update and that update, it gets really tricky. And uh, yeah, we just don't have a good idea yet that is actually useful for drivers to make things simpler instead of just coding it yourself and tracking the dependency yourself because you know best what depends on what, and which is not like just the duplication of the existing schedule work stuff that the kernel already has. Another thing that has been talked a bit about is uh, a state readout like the Intel driver does uh, for fast boot. That might be something which is, uh, is worth sharing. Uh, there's uh, more extensions uh, coming up, kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. And one thing I kind of hope would happen is that uh, the IGT test suite we use for Intel uh, would be converted into something generic. There's a bit of work going on as kind of the uh, KMS validation uh, test suite. How much time do you have? 30 minutes? Oh, to left, yeah. I meant. Does it? Yeah, so uh, KMS extensions is uh, with all the property stuff, you can fairly easily do uh, driver private extensions. You probably have all the state objects subclassed anyway, so that's the place you can track that. And things which are currently going on or talked about is kind of color manager for like color profiles with, with color space conversions and pre and post gamma ramps and things like that. There's a plane blending and, and set ordering and, and these kind of things. And uh, 
really, if you're going to generally useful extensions, they should be done. Uh, the state should be moved into the core state structures so that there's a uniform interface across all drivers. Uh, and kind of to avoid uh, property proliferation, which is a problem I think we already have in, in KMS with kind of every driver doing their own thing. And yeah, fundamentally, I mean, the same rules apply to any other kernel API in DRM. You kind of need to have open source user space. It needs to be tested and all that. So, so that's kind of uh, more generic looking into the future thing. Uh, and the other bit is Android support because there's constant rumors that maybe Chrome OS and Android and everyone else is just going to jump onto the upstream atomic train. Uh, and the big thing missing there really is, is fences. And it's the atomic helpers are already kind of implemented to, to support fences. There's a generic code to wait for, for fences on kind of the the, the, choir side, the input side and the DRM event stuff could be refactored pretty easily to instead of signal a DRM event, signal a fence object. So from the driver point of view, there's almost no work to be done there, which is nice. The problem really is that the hardware composer expects the, a per buffer release fence, uh, which should be signaled when that buffer is no longer used by the scan ad engine. So that usually happens on the next flip before that next flip is scheduled, which means you can trivially easily cause a, a kernel deadlock. And yeah, that's probably not going to work for upstream. So there's a, there's a bit of fundamental semantic problem that we recently discovered. Uh, can you quickly explain why you propose a deadlock? Oh, so you, you, you do a schedule, a, a page flip. So you display buffer A. And you say, when this buffer is no longer used, signal this fence, because then I want to start rendering. But that's only going to happen on, the, on like the next page flip before you schedule that. So on the next page flip, you grab that fence that you just got from the kernel and say, before you do this page flip, please wait for this fence, which is obviously never going to happen, because that fence depends upon that page flip. And then you have a deadlock. And the entire point of fences is that the kernel or even the hardware implements them for fast synchronization. No, they want they want to release fence for the front buffer before it's a back buffer. The front buffer. Yeah. Uh, that's, a that's a bit weird. <laughs> but the, I mean from their point of view it does make sense because in the Android graphics stack the kernel is not trusted because there has been Android dra graphics drivers of not so awesome quality. And so the most trusted thing in, in, in their graphics uh, framework is Surface Flinger. And so if Surface Flinger guarantees that it's never going to do loops and deadlocks with these fences. And from that point of view, it makes perfect sense to ask for a release fence if you schedule it, because then it can just use it the same way as any other buffer queue that they internally use to shuffle buffers between clients and things in user space. But yeah, for upstream uh, kernel interface that you can use to deadlock the kernel from unprivileged user space is kind of not awesome. Yeah. And the other problem is there's no open source hardware composer around. There's a lot of atomic hardware composers around, but there's no open source one as far as I know. So that's it. Bunch more links to detailed documentation. There's a, a how-to for converting legacy drivers to new atomic. There's two uh, LWN articles that kind of explain the high-level design with more focus on user space and why the interfaces looks like that and how the uh, DRM core is implemented. And then there's the, the DRM doc book, and I put up the link for the uh, Intel rendering because that uses the new Markdown support, so it looks a bit more pretty than the others. And yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Do we still have time for questions? Yeah. Because I, I have 45 minutes here. Uh, well, you started five minutes. Oh, ago, so. OK.
So you meant, yeah. Uh, you said the default page flip is it all. Is okay. All right, sure. So the default page flip implementation does a wait for vblank at the end. Is that is there a reason to do that? Um, no. The default I mean, do we like? Is there any reason so to synchronize at that point? Like, can we just like the vblank will report it asynchronously later, anyways, right? Uh, the there's a lot of default implementations for it, kind of. So right. the default page flip implementation just uh, builds up the atomic state that would, is equivalent to a page flip, and it tells it, do this asynchronously, mm -hmm. which means when it calls atomic commit, it should complete immediately. But the wait for uh, page flip, that's in the helper that implements atomic commit, and that obviously the wait for page flip should, should you're in, asyn in your asynchronous helper, so that shouldn't block the update. And that's also kind of part where I really want to have a, a, a generic async uh, because when you do the async commit, you do the commit to hardware state. And that's kind of the synchronization point. From that point of view, the next, from that point on, the next atomic commit can bash the hardware. And the wait for vblank should happen, should obviously not stall the next page flip because that would result in half. Uh, half the frame rate, but you still want to do the wait for v blank before you call cleanup FB to avoid like releasing the buffer, but sure. it's still getting scanned out. Right. So, so that's, but yeah, okay. if you do it right, it does not actually stall page flips. Okay, yeah, it's, that, just, that it's was, a bit tricky. Yeah, that was my concern. So, I mean, it seems like yeah. we'll end up kind of missing a lot of rendering opportunity potentially if we're always waiting for v blank on every flip rather than just queuing up a bunch, right? Something like this. No, it. it okay. Should work, but yeah, I really hope that now that we have a bunch of drivers, we can look at them and figure out the reasonable way to do async commits that kind of take care of all that. And, and yeah, because it's it's tricky to get right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh. Does anyone uh, have any plans to convert the XF86 video mode setting driver to use the new Atomic APIs? Or uh, what? What should we do about that? I think Eric oh, <laughs> had <laughs> plans. <laughs> yeah, right now I, th I don't think anyone is working on it. But uh, for for like your idea of using pla massive amounts of planes and VC for uh, it, yeah. Yeah, I would I would love to be hacking on the mode setting driver to make it use Atomic. Um, unfortunately, right now I'm stuck in getting kernel code merged for ARM. Because still, DT. still trying to get a clock driver into the tree so I can touch my clocks. It's miserable. <laughs> so yeah, someday I would love to be working on a hardware composer, um, both Android and mode setting using Atomic. Those would both be really interesting to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other good reason would be doing Atomic mode sets, even if like X Render doesn't have the concept just for VT switches, so that. X stops enabling things the wrong way around and then runs into, hey, I can't enable all of these things because the other X server enabled in the screens the other way around and yeah, that kind of stuff. And then you do VT switch and X dies. It still seems like there's some bugs in our mode set handling, so it seems like this would avoid a lot of the pitfalls that we wanted to. I mean, the, we, we have the, the, uh, the FBDEF side of Atomic, at least in 4.4, so that FBDEF does Atomic. But yeah, that still needs X to do Atomic. Adding that render is not Yeah, I mean, you, you, don't, you, you don't even need to add it to X render. Just you can't. You do need to add it to X render as a new request, because the only thing you can do right now is set one CRTC. So I could, I could change X server's implementation to always call the atomic ioctals, and it would be missing the point. No, no I mean, at, uh, doing atomic mode sets for VT switches. Oh, sorry. Because that's kind of a, you have one X configuration, and the other you do a VT switch, and then it just goes through CRTCs and ends up with an impossible intermediate state and rage quit. We at least that's the thing that they fairly always complain about, somewhat. Right. 
So on VT switch, it would be a problem, but if you might also like that to be something that you can set from the client yeah, side as well. Yeah, that would be well. even better. But and and that you actually do have to add new requests for. That's what I was saying. That's uh, all. David had a, another one, I think. Um, so with legacy mode setting, we always had the problem that um, we couldn't reset planes uh, if the compositor wasn't aware of planes. The, is there some way in atomic mode setting to like? do a fresh start instead of incremental updates, just say reset everything, any of the properties that the compositor might not be aware of, color conversions and so on? Uh, we thought about that and decided it's too hard. <laughs> no, I mean the problem is, so you boot up and you decide that this is special, I need to always rotate the screen. So in a way the, leg uh, the, the incremental update actually makes some sense. What you could do is, is snapshot the atomic state at boot up and assume this one actually works because the firmware and the driver tried really hard to like get the initial boot screen right. You, you snapshot that and for that you don't actually need to know, understand all the properties because it's all generic. So you just snapshot all the properties state. And when anything bad happens, like uh, an X server dies, uh, does the system like in Login manager could hard reset atomic state to something reasonable again. That, yeah, that might be a possible solution to the problem of yeah. resetting to a known state. Just reset to boot up state. I mean, it's, I think it's fine if, if you like switch between compositors or something like that, if they pick up the current mode and just continue with that. But there are like, issues if, like currently, if you switch to a you know, compositor which supports planes and then you switch back to X, you just keep those planes uh, on top of everything else, and that's just annoying because... Well, that yeah. sounds like your compositor didn't clean up things correctly. And just, I mean, well, if you leave thing, planes enabled, then the next compositor can just read them, so it's also a bit of information leak. I mean, read them through the KMS API. <laughs> sure, but we never care for that. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, but right now resets to known state is essentially you need something that understands everything. And doing a reset to known state in drivers is kind of who exactly needs that and is going to make sure that it's always perfectly maintained. And if you do it in user space, it's oh, you have still have the same upgrade things and then there's a new property you don't understand and boom. Maybe they'll get around it. I don't know. Anything else? I guess that's it, and there's break time. Thanks a lot. Thanks. advanced cable. HDMI works with the Intel driver. Yeah, well, only if you have the matching plug, I think. I always carry them all. Oh.